I discovered the eight immortal kings of Samaria lived a total of 241,200 years. I have discovered through my research that these type of stories have an element of truth to them. Immortality is not only a possibility, but a reality. Could these people still exist in secret? Could they be watching? Is there are numerous meanings to the various logos, names, and colors we use? One of the hermetic principles is that the all is mine, the universe is mental. According to esoteric teachings, survivors of lost ancient civilizations seeded us through the mystery schools. Nearly all our great cosmological myths forming the foundation of the various sacred books of the world are based upon the Atlantean mystery traditions. Never dismiss a story because it is well known that such tales always have an element of truth to them. As uh, was mentioned here, uh, I made uh, the uh, mistake of my lifetime uh, more, more than 30 years ago uh, of writing uh, this book, The Twelfth Planet. Uh, by the way, uh, we have made some posters uh, replicating this original cover and I autographed them, so they are available here. <coughs> Uh, but before that, I made another mistake much earlier uh, when I was just a schoolboy, uh, fortunate, and I am stressing the word fortunate, to study the Bible, uh, some call it the Old Testament, uh, in its original uh, Hebrew language. And we reached chapter 6 of Genesis, and uh, it's the story about... Uh, the events leading to the, the flood, the deluge. And I raised my hand and asked the teacher why is the word uh, in one of the first sentences of chapter 6 of Genesis, why is it translated giants? There were giants upon the earth uh, in those days and uh, thereafter too. Uh, because the Hebrew word is uh, nephilim, coming from the root nafol, which means to descend, to come down, in context from heaven to earth. And uh, I was expecting uh, the teacher to compliment me and say, Sitchin, very good, very good, you know your Hebrew. Uh, and instead, I was uh, very harshly reprimanded uh, for questioning the Bible. Uh, but I was not questioning the Bible, on the contrary, I was trying to point out the need to uh, understand exactly what it says. So this became a uh, obsession with me. What, what did the Bible mean by this word, Nephilim? Uh, who were they? Why are they uh, described, described by uh, so many uh, interpreters of the Bible as uh, giants? And this led me eventually to mythology and then to the origins of mythology, the Sumerians. And <laughs> I ended up writing this book, uh, The Twelfth Planet. Now, uh, when somebody mentions this book, uh, usually the comments are uh, limited to, uh, uh, well, it's a book about uh, the Anunnaki who came from another planet. Uh, called Nibiru, etc. But actually, in the uh, uh, more than 350 pages of that book, and more than 120 illustrations, I did much more than just talk about uh, another planet and uh, advanced beings who came from it. Uh, I, for example, uh, I gave the date based on the Sumerian uh, tablets 
of when we, not only how, which is a given in detail, but when, when we homo sapiens were brought about, and I said, and if people have their book, The Twelfth Planet, they can see that I said 300,000 years ago. And uh, lo and behold, on the way from New York, where I live, uh, to Los Angeles now, I opened the New York Times, and there is a report there about a successful uh, deciphering of the Neanderthal genome, and uh, in, among other things, it mentions there that it's now definitely established that Homo sapiens suddenly appeared 300,000 years ago. And I said that, <laughs> thank you. And I said that uh, uh, back in the book, when it was published 1976. Uh, I, for example, uh, said that Mars it was a way station. The Danunaki had a station, a way station, stayed on Mars. And at that time, Mars was deemed to be uh, airless and waterless and totally uh, uninhabitable. And now, of course, uh, uh, we know differently. So in many, in many areas where I relied on the Sumerian tablets, on ancient knowledge, but understanding it in light of our modern science. So there's absolutely no conflict between science and Bible and those ancient Sumerian tablets. So back to the reason for uh, this uh, uh, gathering, the 2012 problem. Now, uh, the first thing I'd like to remind uh, uh, the audience is that uh, there have been other uh, instances of uh, uh, great expectations, good or bad, uh, about uh, uh, it's going to happen, something is going to happen. Uh, it was, uh, if you remember, the, the millennium, uh, the year 2000, it was supposed to be the, the predicted time. And uh, when people ask me then, uh, what will happen in 2000? I said, uh, after 2000 will come 2001. <laughs> and uh, that's basically what happened. Uh, then there was, for reasons that I cannot fathom, the whole excitement about 2003. And uh, the planet that I discussed in my book uh, is sometimes the third is planet X, the, the tenth planet which is the 12th member of the solar system. Uh, so it's planet X, which means the 10th and the unknown. And uh, so in 2003, there was a whole expectation that uh, this planet is on its way back and it's going to cause havoc. And uh, at that time, I think it was not Patagonia, but Costa Rica that was <laughs> the favored refuge. Uh, and, and, nothing, and nothing happened in 2003. So now uh, the excitement is about uh, Planet X uh, returning and doing whatever it will do in 2012. And uh, this is uh, related to so-called Mayan prophecies. Now I have uh, devoted a lot of time, as a matter of fact, one of my books uh, the Lost Realms deals only with the Americas, North America, Mesoamerica, and South America. And I have studied as much as I could about the, the Mayas and the Aztecs and, and the Incas and so on. And uh, I have not come across anything that comes even close to Mayan prophecies. There are a few codexes, so called codexes, which is like folded pages, and <laughs> there are no such predictions, but I don't claim uh, to know everything, and uh, some people do believe that uh, uh, something uh, predictable or unpredictable uh, will happen in 2012, 
and that is based on Mayan astronomy. Their astronomers were very sophisticated, and that's what they predicted. So here are some, on this slide, some examples from Mayan codexes of their astronomers at work. Uh, these are three or four examples of Mayan astronomers uh, looking or scanning the heavens. And uh, I don't think it looks too advanced, at least to me. Now, what the Mesoamerican peoples did have uh, is uh, a calendar. And as a matter of fact, they had three calendars, not just one. One calendar, uh, which is known as the long count, uh, counted the passage of time this way. And then there were two other calendars that were intermeshed in some way, which I will explain. And one was called the Tzolkin, that counted the day-by-day day, day day passage of time, and another one that counted it uh, differently. So there were three calendars uh, in Mesoamerica, but uh, the main one, which is called the Long Count, uh, was really not a Mayan calendar at all. Uh, in Mesoamerica, which is Mexico and Guatemala, and that part of the New World, uh, there were actually three basic cultures or uh, civilizations, uh, certainly when the, the Spaniards arrived. One was uh, centered more or less here, uh, which was called uh, that one of the Olbecks. The Mayas were here, mostly in Yucatan, and the Aztecs were here, more in central Mexico. Now, the Olmecs, who were the oldest and are considered the mother civilization of Mesoamerica, uh, left behind, and that's how uh, people, archaeologists, uh, came to know about them. They left behind uh, quite a number, I think by now about 20 or so have been discovered, colossal stone heads carved to look presumably like their chieftains, and there's no doubt that uh, they all look like uh, 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 people from Africa. As a matter of fact, when the first ones were discovered, the Mexican archaeologists tried not to uh, report it or to play it down because it was quite embarrassing to them. Uh, how come that the earliest civilization of Mesoamerica, uh, before the Aztecs and before the Mayas, were uh, uh, black Africans. But, the, but this is the fact. And now there are quite a number of museums, uh, especially one if you go to Mexico, I recommend that you visit it. It is in a town called Jalapa, uh, devoted exclusively uh, to uh, the Olmec civilization. And uh, among the exhibits, <laughs> curiously enough, there are toys, toys of all my children. And as you can see, some of them had wheels. Uh, while, uh, as you know, uh, every respected scholar and archaeologist will tell you that the wheel was totally unknown in the Americas. So uh, this was discovered in the Americas, uh, in Mexico. Another interesting discovery uh, was of this toy, uh, which uh, uh, to me looks like an elephant. And uh, <coughs> there are no elephants in the Americas. So obviously, the uh, Olmecs uh, who made toys for their children uh, remembered, remembered and what they remembered from wherever they came, uh, from Africa. And in Africa, there were a, a number of civilizations, and the earliest one of them was uh, the Nile civilization, later known as, as Egypt, but it was Nubia and other countries. Now, uh, I, I must tell you that if you go to Jalapa, you will neither see the uh, wheel toys, and you will neither see this elephant toy, 
because when I reported that on my website, uh, the uh, people who read my books uh, went there and uh, <coughs> these exhibits were removed uh, for all kinds of excuses. <coughs> now the, uh, the Olmecs uh, depicted uh, the god <coughs> who brought them over uh, from Africa. Uh, they called him uh, Quetzalcoatl, which meant the winged, the winged uh, serpent. Some say the plumed serpent, but I prefer the winged. And uh, that's how he looked. <coughs> this is not uh, uh, a carving by Sitchin. This is a, an Olmec carving. Uh, and uh, you can see that this is uh, somebody definitely bearded. <coughs> And one uh, feature distinguishing uh, people in Mesoamerica is that they don't have facial hair. So this again is someone not, not from Mesoamerica, not from the Americas at all. Uh, that's how <coughs> he looked. Now, uh, the question arose in time, <coughs> when, when did uh, the Olmecs led or uh, helped come over by this uh, deity. When did they come uh, to Mesoamerica? Uh, so as part of the embarrassment of admitting that Africans were there before, uh, you know, the, the, the Hispanics or, or the Aztecs. <coughs> uh, so the, the notion was, well, maybe around uh, 200 AD, and then it was maybe 200 BC, and then maybe 500 BC, but all the evidence pointed out to 3000 BC, 3000, almost 5000 years ago, which raised, of course, other questions. How could people from Africa travel across the Atlantic so long? So <coughs> that was not a welcome finding. <coughs> the first time I was there with, uh, with the group that traveled with me, uh, in Jalapa, uh, as you enter the museum, there's one of those colossal heads, and then there's a wall, a wall uh, depicting the various civilizations of Mexico, of the Americas, and when they started. And <laughs> as we go down the steps and I neared this uh, wall with its depictions, I was really startled to see, and I'm pointing out at it, that it says, all next civilization, 3000 BC. And I said, well, you know, finally somebody admits it. Uh, so uh, that part of the wall is also gone by now. <coughs> and as I mentioned, I uh, discussed some of these uh, things and more of them in the book uh, devoted entirely to the Americas, the Lost Realms. <clears throat> now, uh, back to the issue of 2012 and the calendar. So the key calendar uh, that really gives uh, time from now uh, the, uh, those who study it and, uh, and, and could decipher the, the, the script uh, say that it's not 3000 BC, but it's exactly 3113, 3113 BC. They even say that day one, day one of this calendar was someday equivalent to, to someday in August, August 3113 BC. And the way this calendar works is that uh, there are signs, we can call them hieroglyphs, or icons, whatever. <coughs> and uh, one kind of sign is the number of days, just days, uh, which are given here. And then the other sign gives the number of another unit of days uh, given here. And then a third one given here. And finally, it ends up on some of those many monuments with a unit of time called Baktun. Baktun, 
which is equal to 144,000 days. So, adding up uh, so many baktuns would add up to so many days, and this sign uh, to so many days, and totaling them all, and you divide, as it's done here, into the number of days in a year at 365 and a quarter. And so you arrive at the number of days that when this monument was set up and dated, they said this monument was set up and dated so many days since day one that the way we count it. So if you divide it by the number of years and deduct 3,113, you arrive at that the 13th Bakhtun uh, will end, will reach its culmination in 2012. So this is the basis of all the 2012 predictions. Already when I uh, was studying the material for my book, The Lost Realms, I found that way back in the previous century, not the 21st, but previous to the 20th, in the 19th century, it was observed that while it is true that we count 365 and a quarter days in the year, this calendar, as you can see, or maybe it's not so easy to see it, but anyway, it is using the number 360 as the base of multiples, 360. So some have already said uh, more than 100 years ago that the real way to understand this calendar is not to divide the number of days by 365 and a quarter, but by the way this calendar was constructed, 360. Now, if you divide the number of days by 360, you get more years. And according to that, the 13th Bakhtun will end or reach its culmination only in 2087 BC, not in 2012. So it's a matter of choice uh, which way uh, to divide the number of days. And uh, if it's done the way that some believe, and I do too, uh, then you arrive at 2087, uh, which means that uh, if you accept uh, this way of calculating, you have, uh, what, some 70 or 75 years uh, before you go to Patagonia. <laughs> There's another, another problem with this notion that things will come to an end, to a culmination, to, to a catastrophe, to whatever, when the 13th Bakhtun will culminate. And the problem is that that calendar did not stop using Bakhtuns as the final unit. After Bakhtuns, he had a unit called Piktun, which was a Bakhtun, which is based on 360, times 20. And here is another listing that shows that after the Bakhtun, there were units on the main monuments who covered a Piktun. So uh, there's really, uh, with all due respect to our others, and everybody is entitled uh, uh, to their opinion and their uh, understanding of events or evidence, uh, that there is nothing, uh, in my humble opinion, uh, to indicate that uh, the Mayan predictions, if any, uh, culminate with the 30th Bakhtun, uh, because then we'll start a Piktun. So, uh, 
uh, this leaves us with the problem of uh, what indeed, if anything, did the Mayas or the Aztecs, what did they say uh, or indicate? <clears throat> so now we have to fall back to the other two calendars, uh, which uh, contain a more interesting clues uh, than uh, when the Olmecs arrived in, in Mesoamerica. <clears throat> the other two, if you re recall, are called the Tolkien and the Hub. Now, uh, nobody knows really uh, the origin of those terms. Uh, neither do I know what Tolkien means, except that it's a count of days. But uh, the Hub interested me because that was an epithet or another nickname for the god, the Egyptian god, who was called Toth in Egypt. And one of his epithets was Hab. And here is a page from a textbook about uh, Toth in Egypt and the various hieroglyphic names in which his name was written. And one of them was definitely Hab. So this re raises an interesting, uh, intriguing possibility that maybe the god that was uh, renamed Quetzalcoatl in Mesoamerica, maybe it was really the Egyptian god Toth. And indeed, according to uh, Egyptian uh, records, uh, which I discuss at length in other books, uh, Toth was forced by his uh, half-brother rival, uh, the god Ra in Egypt. He was forced to leave Egypt around 3100 BC. And if one wants to be precise, perhaps on that date, 3113 BC, when the uh, long, long count calendar began. So if this is a, indeed a clue, there's another interesting thing, and that is in Egypt, uh, the number 52 was considered to be the secret number of Toth that it is the number of weeks, seven-day weeks in the year, is not a coincidence, but uh, I won't spend time on that. But this secret number uh, was 52. And these two other calendars, the Tzolkin and the Hub, uh, that mesh together and turn around, come back to the same spot once every 52 years as if they were designed or in some other way connected with this god Toth, Quetzalcoatl, the Mayas called him Kukulkan, which means the same thing, the plumed or the winged serpent. Now, this thing, this 52 years cycle, which is called the bundle, the, the Mayas called it the bundle, uh, played a role in, in the history of Mesoamerica because this god, Quetzalcoatl, alias Toth, uh, who gave the civilization, the Olmec and the others in Mesoamerica, left. He definitely, the records say that he left. But before he left, he said, I will be back. I will be back precisely on the first day of the bundle when the cycle completes 52 years. He just didn't say after how many cycles. So in 1519, in 1519 AD, uh, the Aztec King Montezuma got word that a bearded god a white bearded god, the way I showed you depicted, has returned. And 1519 AD, as we counted, was exactly the day a bundle, a bundle year. So Montezuma made <laughs> the mistake of uh, assuming that uh, the god has returned, took all the precious uh, objects, including a golden calendar because this was the God's creation and presented it to him. And that was uh, the beginning 
of the end of the Aztecs and the conquest of America by the Spaniards, by the conquistadors. Uh, now uh, I found in in many among, in one of my many trips uh, to to Mexico and going to uh, uh, smaller and regional museums, I found uh, this depiction on a monument, a Mayan monument, by the way, showing a Mayan chieftain uh, lying prostrate or whatever this position means. Uh, hearing or being told goodbye, I don't know what, but this sign, this sign in Mayan hieroglyphics means speaking. This plumed god, the wing, the wing god is saying to the Mayan chieftain, let's say, uh, something that has to do with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten planets. So one can say, uh, without any certainty beyond speculation, that this god, the plumed serpent, says to the Mayan, you know, Arrivederci, uh, I'm going back to the tenth planet, uh, but I'll be back. And this, I think, is a, a very impressive and, and crucial piece of evidence. <clears throat> now, uh, so who, who, who were, not just who was Quetzalcoatl or Kukulkan, but who were in general the, uh, the, the Mayan, the Aztec gods? Now, if you go to various uh, uh, places in, uh, in Mexico, in Guatemala, you see uh, these depictions in temples. Uh, you see this depiction of one of the deities. Uh, deities, again, uh, uh, bearded and certainly not uh, Mesoamerican. And I show comparisons to objects and depictions found not necessarily in Egypt, but further east in Mesopotamia. You see the comparison here. You see the comparison here. Uh, if you look at the famous Mexican pyramids, uh, which are step pyramids, they are not uh, smooth-sided like the Egyptian pyramids. They are more uh, similar or entirely similar to the uh, Sumerian and, and later Babylonian uh, high-rise temples called ziggurats, which again were uh, step pyramids. So the uh, connection, uh, as I have concluded, leads not just to Egypt, but to what was before Egypt, to a civilization that preceded by almost a thousand years, uh, 800 years at least, of the Egyptian civilization, that one of Mesopotamia. So this is a map of the Near East. Uh, this is Egypt, this is uh, the Sinai Peninsula, this is the Middle East, uh, this is what is now Iraq, uh, ancient Mesopotamia. And, and there, uh, about uh, 4,000, at, at 4,000 BC, some 6,000 years ago, uh, there emerged uh, suddenly uh, this is the term used by others, suddenly, unexpectedly, uh, almost out of nowhere, etc., a high civilization. Now, not only that uh, I devoted uh, most of the book, The Twelfth Planet, to it, and, and subsequent books, but uh, I, I once said that if, if I were awakened uh, from my sleep and somebody say, would hold a gun to me and say, Talk about the Sumerians. I, I will survive because I, I can talk for hours and, and days about the Sumerians. But this is not uh, the occasion for it. So I will just mention that in addition to all the firsts that are attributed to the Sumerians, the first this and the first that, etc., uh, etc., et uh, without doubt, one of their most outstanding legacies 
is the introduction of writing. And this is an example of Sumerian writing called cuneiform because it was done with the stylus on, on a tablet, clay tablet that was still wet and then it dried, sometimes was uh, dried in the kiln uh, to become more permanent. And this is the origin of writing uh, without which uh, uh, I couldn't write my books. So the other was uh, the cylinder seal. Uh, in, in a way that nobody has yet figured out, uh, their artist could take a stone, as often as not semi-precious, make a cylinder out of it, carve in it, in reverse as a negative, the image or the writing or whatever they wanted to depict. And when this was rolled on wet clay, like a rotary press, the positive image uh, was seen, was embedded on, on, on the wet clay and again became permanent. Now, how they did it to this day, nobody has figured out. But this is one way in which we have not only text from antiquity due to the writing, but also the way we have pictorial evidence uh, from antiquity. And unlike the, the, the Mayas and their uh, primitive uh, astronomy, uh, one of the Sumerian uh, achievements was a very sophisticated uh, astronomy uh, they described uh, uh, planets that we have discovered only in the past uh, 200 years uh, or so after the introduction of the telescope. Uh, they depicted, uh, not, 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 only, uh, not, not only listed those planets, but they described them. And in my book, The Twelfth Planet, I give Sumerian descriptions of the planets that our spacecraft, the pioneer spa spacecraft, visited only in a, in a, few, a few decades ago. And I said, according to the Sumerians, uh, Neptune looks this way, Uranus they, looks that way. They explained uh, the odd orbit of Pluto uh, and so on. And uh, one of the cylinder seals that I have uh, come upon uh, looking at uh, seals or their imprints of, of thousands and thousands of them was this one, uh, which uh, has since been visited and looked at uh, by, by thousands of people in the museum in Berlin. Uh, it is known as Cylinder Seal VA243. Uh, it's supposedly a, a mythological depiction of a god, because the gods are a myth, they never existed, granting the plow uh, to mankind. And uh, there's many other seals, uh, the goddess name, by the way, uh, there were ornaments of uh, celestial objects. And when I looked at this one, I said, <laughs> this looks to me like a solar system. And this is what is the, not without the arrow, <laughs> this is what is depicted on that uh, cylinder seal up here. And uh, this, first of all, shows uh, a star, the sun, and not the earth in the center, as uh, the ancients were supposed ignorantly to believe that the earth is the center of the universe. So this is a star, the sun, uh, surrounded by planets, and if you compare this depiction to the way we would depict planets orbiting our sun. You see that the location and the sizes are, uh, match each other, uh, with one great exception that uh, between Mars and Jupiter, Mars and Jupiter, uh, the Sumerians depicted one more relatively large planet. Uh, that uh, of whose existence we are not really, but we are supposed not to know. 
uh, and this count, by the way, uh, this count of uh, 10, 10 objects uh, circling, uh, orbiting the sun, uh, plus the moon, making a total of 12, hence the title of my first book, The Twelfth Planet. It should really have been the the tenth planet, which is the twelfth member of the solar system. So when the publisher considered publishing my first book, he says to me, forget it, <laughs> it's too long, it's the twelfth planet. So, uh, so, so it's the tenth, the tenth planet, which is the, the, called the twelfth planet. Uh, so here, on many mon monuments, and I uh, showed only one example, is again all those, uh, the sun, the moon, uh, all the other planets, uh, plus this one, uh, which is sometimes depicted by a wing disk, uh, this mysterious planet. Now, uh, did such a planet uh, exist? Was it uh, uh, really uh, effect, affected this in antiquity? And uh, the Sumerians, uh, dedicated to, to writing as they were, uh, indeed uh, left behind uh, tales on clay tablets. And one of them is called the Epic of Creation, uh, which uh, tells the story of how that one more planet uh, happened to join the solar system. And the Epic of Creation describes the uh, systematic or step-by-step uh, uh, coming into being of uh, the planets around the sun. I said there was a, an olden planet called Tiamat, and then uh, there were two, two planets that came into being between Tiamat and the sun, uh, which we now call uh, <coughs> uh, Mercury and, and Venus. And then other planets came into being always like, uh, okay. like uh, two, two at a time. Uh, and into that solar system, at some point, uh, uh, an upheaval uh, took place because a, a planet that belonged to another solar system and was somehow thrust out of it was passing by our solar system and the gravitational pull of those planets that did exist the solar system started to attract it and change its course from this way, this is all a diagram of course, uh, this way more inwards, inwards, and finally into a collision with this olden planet Tiamat. And the collision had to occur because while all the planets in the solar system that the coalesced uh, as science modern science believes, out of a, a cloud of dust, orbit in this one direction, counterclockwise. But this invader, this stranger, came and it is orbiting clockwise. So the collision was really unavoidable. Uh, the text referred to it as a celestial battle. I, uh, the <laughs> deal in, in the book, The Twelfth Planet, and then in another book, the title Genesis Revisited, uh, step by step, and explain scientifically what, uh, what ancient words mean. But there were then a series of collisions. Uh, this planet, the invader, uh, whom the Babylonians, Babylonians renamed Marduk in honor of their uh, national god, uh, had developed moons or satellites uh, Tiamat also had a host led by a large a moon called Kingu. And there was a series of collisions. And finally, in the final collision, uh, Tiamat was uh, split in two. One part was totally smashed uh, to bits and pieces and became a, uh, an orbiting band, uh, which we they call the asteroid belt. And by the way, the Sumerian explanation of the origin of the asteroid belt is the only available explanation 
because modern science has no explanation for it. And the other half, uh, more or less uh, intact, but only half a planet, was shunted to a new orbit plus the largest moon of Tiamat and became our planet Earth and uh, became the uh, planet Earth. And if you uh, look at the, uh, at, at the way our planet really looks, you see that uh, uh, there is this huge cavity, uh, which uh, we call the, the Pacific Ocean, and the continents have, uh, have spread out. And from half, uh, half a planet, we have now a, a, a round planet, partly rounded uh, by water. OK. We are back in business, I hope. <laughs> uh, all right, so the question is, once uh, that collision had taken place, uh, uh, the Earth was created with its moon, what happened to the invader? According to all those texts, the invader uh, became a permanent member of our solar system with a great elliptical orbit coming back to our vicinity uh, once every 3,600 years, uh, uh, give or take. And that is the, so this is how, uh, uh, according to the Sumerian epic of creation, uh, the planet, so-called planet X, the 10th planet, the 12th planet, the Sumerians called it Nibiru, uh, which meant planet of the crossing. That's when it reaches the uh, proximity of Earth and reaches the, its point of uh, perigee, the closest to the sun, they called it the crossing. And indeed, uh, uh, very often, when uh, it neared, it, when it neared uh, the Earth, uh, the uh, uh, symbol for that planet changed from a wing disk to a cross. And on some of the uh, uh, slides that I was going to show to you, uh, around 1000 BC, the symbol of the cross began to appear, replacing the uh, a symbol of the wing disk. And the reason was that uh, that planet, Nibiru, was nearing Earth, and the uh, time, the moment of crossing, uh, was uh, nearing, was expected. <coughs> I had a whole <laughs> a slew of slides to show you. Uh, with uh, ancient evidence, uh, with quotes uh, even from the Bible, from various prophets, uh, Isaiah, Amos, uh, and others, that started around that time, uh, 800 BC, 750 BC, to speak about the nearing day of the Lord. The reference was to a celestial Lord, uh, a planet, a planet considered a god by the Babylonians. Uh, and uh, the, as time went on, 800 BC, 750 BC, 700, 650, and I had uh, the whole sequence for you uh, quoting uh, this prophet and that prophet in the Bible. The, the talk, the prophecy about the coming, the coming day of the Lord became more and more imminent. Uh, it's coming, it will show up from the south, uh, it will, uh, the, the skies will darken when it appears, uh, there will be some other upheavals and so on. Uh, it, similarly, there were the same kind of uh, predictions and I illustrated them both with the text and with <laughs> the diagrams uh, in, in the uh, Babylonian and Assyrian uh, tablets and other depictions. There were actually uh, records of astronomical observations from that time saying that the planet is nearing, the planet is appearing, the planet is seen uh, reddish, glowing, etc., etc., etc. And finally, the day of the Lord uh, took place. 
Uh, it took place exactly in 556 BC, and uh, it is remembered uh, in ancient records as uh, uh, an unusual and unexpected solar eclipse, a total solar eclipse, uh, and the shadow passed precisely over a certain place called Haran, which <laughs> played played an important role in those events. Um, again, I regret that I, I cannot show you uh, the evidence for it, but uh, uh, it's all in my book. Uh, it's all in my book, uh, the lost book uh, of Enki. It's all in the book, uh, The End of Days. So um, <laughs> you, you can read about it uh, to some extent, although not, not, not all the pictorial evidence is there. So what it, it amounts to is uh, the biblical prophecies that are usually taken as, as, as one body of prophecy. This and this will happen. Uh, were actually separated by me, literally, the way I challenged the teacher uh, when I was a schoolboy about the precise meaning of the word in the Bible that if you follow the biblical prophecies precisely what does it say and what does it mean, you see that it was split and divided into two separate phenomena. One was the day of the Lord, which was the return, the return of the planet, which I suggest did take place in 500 and 56 BC. Now, if the orbit of the planet is roughly, and I explain in the book, uh, the end of days, why it's roughly, if it's roughly 3,600 years, so the next nearing of the planet, if you deduct 556 from about 3,600, uh, you're talking about the 29th century uh, AD. So if those who uh, are afraid or, or, or create a great concerns about uh, the Mayan calendar and the year 2012, which as I explained before, uh, is iffy even if you accept the Mayan and the Mesoamerican calendars, uh, maybe it's the 2087 uh, AD, not, not 2012, then if they are linked, as most of them are, uh, to the return of the planet, Nibiru, planet X, uh, the planet of the gods, the planet of the Anunnaki, if that is uh, what is intimated, then it is uh, baseless. The planet will not return uh, in this century, neither in 2012 nor in 2087. But there are those prophecies. There is the prom promise of Quetzalcoatl, who said, I will be back. So what we should expect, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is not the imminent return of the planet. We should expect the return of the gods, of the Anunnaki, as the Sumerians called them. And therefore, the question is, first of all, if, because not everybody has to accept uh, the biblical prophecies as, uh, as, as, as valid, and not everybody does, but uh, if we accept the biblical prophecies as our uh, guides, and uh, if we compare the biblical prophecies with past events, then everything that was prophesied by Jeremiah, by uh, uh, Isaiah, by Ezekiel, etc., about their days uh, did take place. So I I am inclined. Uh, to accept the veracity of the Bible also uh, in this respect. 
and say that uh, there will be a return of the gods. The question is then, when? Now, this is not a new question because uh, the last book, apart from the Chronicles, the last book uh, in, the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, is the book of Daniel, and it deals with this very same question. Daniel has spent his days and his uh, encounters with, with angelic beings, etc., uh, by keeping asking them when, when, when. And uh, he got various answers, uh, most of them, or all of them, <laughs> very enigmatic. And then to the last day, uh, the last uh, page of the book of Daniel, uh, it's still a question. He, he didn't know, and it ends up with saying, you know, the enigma, the mystery is still there. But the clearest, the clearest answer of several that he got was that uh, the end of days, we have left behind the day of the Lord, and we are now dealing with the end of days, which is how I started discussing this is my own calendar business. At the end of days will occur, Daniel was told, after time, times and a half, uh, which didn't do him much good because he didn't understand what it means, which time, what time, what does time, times and a half mean, uh, etc. Now, one of those that uh, spent most of his time and most of his life, I could say, uh, trying to decipher this enigma, when will the end of days take place, whether this signifies the return of the gods or some other uh, cataclysmic or, or other events, uh, was uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Now, he's mostly known for his uh, calculations of orbits, etc., uh, but he left behind pages and volumes and volumes of handwritten manuscript dealing with this issue. What does time, times and a, times and a half mean? And it so happened that uh, about two years ago, uh, this whole collection of uh, Sir Isaac Newton manuscripts uh, ended up in Jerusalem at one of the libraries there, donated by some uh, uh, benefactor who, who bought uh, the, the whole uh, collection of, of uh, Newton manuscripts. And that included a page, one page written on both sides in ink, this way and this way, where his final calculations were given. And I found out about it because the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, in a program uh, about Sir Isaac Newton on some anniversary, I don't recall which, his birth, his death, <laughs> 200 years or 250 years, uh, mentioned at the very end that uh, uh, before he died, Sir Isaac Newton calculated the end of days to take place in 2160 AD. Pretty soon. <clears throat> so I uh, succeeded in tracking down uh, that page uh, uh, and was, was, was given a, uh, a facsimile, Xerox or whatever of it, on both sides. And uh, as I studied it, the front and the back, I, I realized what, what he was after. Uh, 2,160 sounded to me like a familiar figure. And <laughs> among the slides that you uh, uh, will not see this evening uh, were several dealing with, with the Zodiac. Uh, one of the uh, inventions, or first, uh, with which the uh, Sumerians are credited, but they really uh, got it from the Anunnaki, uh, is uh, zodiacal time. Uh, you can imagine that when uh, the Anunnaki coming from a planet 
where one year equals 3,600 of hours, because what is a year? One orbit around the sun. Uh, they come from their planet and land on this planet <laughs> and, and say, what kind of a crazy place it is, you know, it, it, it runs like crazy around the sun, you know. <laughs> <laughs> before before it's sunrise, it's already sunset. So uh, uh, so they needed they needed uh, I have suggested some kind of a uh, median, some kind of a way to coordinate the the, the time that Earth moves around the sun uh, with the time that their planet moves around the sun, and it so happens that due to a, a phenomenon called precession, uh, which, which, which uh, uh, is the name for a phenomenon that as the Earth goes around the Sun after a year, the 365 and a quarter and all that business days, it does not, it does not come back to precisely the spot from which it started. There is a slight retardation. The retardation and accumulates amounts to one degree of 360 in 72 years. And therefore, if the Anunnaki created a, a zodiac of 12 constellations, in antiquity they were called houses or stations. Uh, uh, so each 12 was 30 degrees. So 30 times 72 is 200. 2,160. And when I saw that page by Sir Isaac Newton, I said, that's what he was after. He was calculating zodiacal time. That was the time the Anunnaki devised to mesh, like those two wheels, between their planet and our planet and its orbit around the sun. Uh, so this, this zodiacal time. So the key, the key to answering the question, if they will return, as I believe they will, if they will return, and the question then is when, which is like asking when is the end of days, according to the book of Daniel, etc. That's what he was told. Time, time, our time, zodiacal time, not your time, our time. One zodiacal period, two zodiacal, or whatever. So I was uh, included uh, several slides that show you that there are all kinds of indications, uh, which I interpreted and I believe uh, indicate that uh, the end of days and the return will take place uh, during the zodiacal uh, age of Pisces. This is our age until the end of this century. So whether you say the Mayan calendar calculated one way is 2087. If you say when is the meshing, what they call the bundle, every 52 years, if you add 52 years to AD 5019, when, when, uh, 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 or test landed. You, know, you add, you add, you, you arrive at the next one at 2097 AD. If you take the zodiacal ages, you arrive at the latest 2100 AD. Uh, so this, I suggest, uh, is when the end of days will occur. Thank you.